welcome to another online sermon from the Boathouse Church. This week we resume our series in 1 Corinthians, and we really hope that this is a very helpful talk for you, wherever you are in the world. 1 Corinthians is one of several letters of correspondence between the Apostle Paul and the house churches of the ancient Greek city of Corinth. Paul wrote this particular letter uh, around the middle of the first century after he had planted a church there. Corinth was the capital city of the region and because of its position on an isthmus, uh, that is a, a neck of land between two harbours, because Corinth was positioned between these two great shipping ports in the middle of the Roman Empire, it had a lot of travellers, a lot of tourists coming through it. It was therefore one of the most visited and most multicultural cities in the empire. It was also one of the most diversely religious cities. Many temples and many gods were worshipped there. And arguably, it was the most promiscuous city in the entire ancient world. It was well known for its prostitutes and a lot of immorality going on there. The great New Testament scholar Gordon Fee called Corinth the New York and Las Vegas of the ancient world. So Paul brought Christianity to the great city of Corinth. Uh, A number of people were converted there, some influential people in fact, and uh, a church was planted there. Actually, technically, a number of churches in different houses uh, were planted there. And now about three years later, he was writing back to them. The other thing worth knowing is that the Corinthians seem to be enamored with looking good and being impressive. It was a highly competitive culture in Corinth, be it orally as a public speaker, be it in the area of wisdom and philosophy, or in the areas of fashion and hairstyle. Uh, be it in sport and the games, and then in areas of spirituality, both inside and outside of the church. The Corinthians were proud, highly competitive, and heavily class-based in their culture. In fact, the Corinthians went to great lengths to have their names engraved on buildings or statues. It was very much part of their culture to boast and be proud of themselves in various ways. Now, does that sound familiar? We are all prone to the same mistakes the Corinthians made in the first century with us here in the 21st century in London. We can just hide it better, but we're all prone to those same mistakes. There's a lot of similarities, I think, between Corinth and London thing is that the culture of Corinth was beginning to cloud and infiltrate the minds, the understanding of the Corinthians on church and the gospel, uh, how they viewed Paul, how they viewed Jesus, how they viewed one another. It was beginning to distort their understanding of all these things. Put simply, Paul had fought hard to put a church in Corinth. Now he's going to have to fight hard to take Corinth out of the church. 1 Corinthians is both Paul's response to disturbing reports he'd heard about the Corinthians, uh, about their divisions within the church and their misunderstandings of the gospel and some of their very questionable behaviour. But it's also his answers to a series of questions they had about a range of different issues, including marriage, singleness, uh, eating certain foods, church conduct, and other things. Chapter 12 brings us to a new section in the letter where Paul is addressing issues and questions about true spirituality and spiritual gifts. No doubt the Corinthians had questions about who was truly spiritual and what gifts are considered the best and how do you get them and things like that. Well, this section is addressing some of those issues and questions. Here it is, beginning at chapter 12, verse 1. 
Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So there are four things here for us. The first one is this. There are many gifts. After Paul's introduction to this whole section in the first three verses, in verse 4, Paul says there are many different gifts. But first of all, what does he mean by gift? What did the apostle have in mind when he uses this term? Well, the original ancient Greek word for gift is charisma, from which we get the word charismatic. But charismatic in the modern sense is quite removed from what Paul meant when he used the word charisma here. Now, Paul doesn't define charisma here in this passage, nor does he or anyone else really define it for us in the rest of the New Testament. But it seems that from what we can glean from Paul and other New Testament writers who use the term, charisma means gift or skill. Uh, But to help us, uh, Paul lists nine examples from verses 8 to 10. So the first one here is wisdom, the gift of being wise. That is someone who uh, is able to make good, wise decisions, but not just in an intellectual sense, but in a godly sense. Someone who thinks uh, with godly wisdom. Uh, The next one is knowledge, someone who has a good breadth of understanding, knowledge, insight, able to retain a lot of information about the world. And the scriptures, uh, the Bible. Third one is faith, gift of faith. Well, all Christians have faith in God, but this would be someone who's gifted in faith would be someone who has a particular strong faith. Um, faith in all circumstances. They never, they never waver in their faith. Healing, that is the ability to heal someone who is sick. Not necessarily in a miraculous way, but someone who's good with medicine, who's particularly uh, got the knack of being able to help people and heal people. So a good doctor or nurse or physio or a therapist who's particularly gifted in that area of medicine might be considered uh, having the gift of healing. Miraculous powers, on the other hand, is a little more mysterious Uh, but perhaps someone who is able to see visions, uh, dream dreams, uh, do things that are considered supernatural perhaps, perhaps a lot rarer. The gift of being able to discern or distinguish between spirits might be someone who is particularly skilled in understanding the occult and uh, witchcraft and so on. Prophecy and tongues are both different forms of inspired speech, uh, whether it's to a whole group of people or just on your own. These are considered uh, being able to speak uh, on behalf of God very clearly and accurately and perhaps in a language that is angelic. Interpretation is the gift of being able to understand what someone was saying in another language, or if they were speaking in some sort of heavenly, angelic, spiritual language. 
Uh, and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, someone can interpret exactly what that means uh, for a person or a congregation. Later on in the chapter, Paul lists even more gifts. Uh, in verse 28, he mentions healing again, but he also says the gift of helping or gift of guidance and then tongues. In his letter to the Roman church, the Christians in Rome, Paul lists prophesying there, serving, teaching, the gift of encouragement, gift of giving, the gift of being able to lead or show mercy. And the Apostle Peter lists two more gifts, uh, the gift of speaking, probably preaching or teaching in some form, um, and the gift of serving. Both umbrella terms, if you like, they cover a, a wide range of things. But the point is that there are many different gifts. Do notice the range here. I believe we all have at least one. Many of us have several, and perhaps a few of us have a lot of them. But look at the list and ask yourself this question. Which of these gifts do I have? Or better, which one of these, or ones of these, do other people say that I have? What do other people say you're gifted in? Now this isn't an exhaustive list, by the way. It can include uh, the gift of music, whether you're a singer or a musician or something, or the gift of organising, administration, um, financial gifts, the, the ability to work well with money and, and finances, the gift of being able to cook really well, and so on. Now, none of us have all the gifts um, that would virtually be impossible for anyone. We're not even supposed to strive to have all the gifts. It's important to make a distinction between uh, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, or more correctly, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness and patience and love and so on. We're to have those as Christians, manifest those, seek to have more of them. But the gifts of the Spirit are diverse and they're dispersed differently to different people. But ask yourself this question. Which of these do I have? There are many gifts and you'll have at least one. Which one do you have? Secondly, there are many gods. Now, of course, uh, Christians believe that there's ultimately one God. But in another sense, and the Bible speaks of this as well, there are many little gods. Many things, people even, that become gods to us. Uh, they are what we worship. They're what we pour our time and money and effort into. Uh, we look to them for guidance. They replace God and they become little gods. Hence the opening section on idols to some extent. Corinth and its neighbouring city, Athens, were notoriously full of temples and idols. And this is where the passage, I think, ought to come home uh, and really grab us. Because we too live in a city where there are idols or gods, if you like, all around us. The gods of fashion and the body beautiful. The gods of materialism and money. The gods of career and climbing the corporate ladder. The gods of scholastic achievement, uh, education, getting your degree and then your master's and then your doctorate, having letters after your name. They can all become gods. They're not gods in and of themselves. Uh, there's nothing wrong with these things per se, but they can become our focal point, the things we worship, the things we think about all the time. And we end up using the gifts that we have for these things. When these things become more important to us and the gifts that we have are used for these things, then we just step back into a Corinthian problem. Going back to your gift or gifts, whatever they may be, what are you using them for? Which God are you serving when you use your gifts? 
Are you using your gifts mostly for financial gain or status recognition as you climb the corporate ladder? Do you use your gifts to get more things for yourself, to bolster your own reputation and your career? Basically, are you using your gifts for idols or for God? His kingdom or yours? There are many gods to serve and use your gifts for. The question is, which God are you serving most of all with your gifts? So to set them on the right course, Paul reminds them of two things. There's one giver. All our gifts come from the one source, the one giver, and that is God. Comes up in the text over and over again, but especially at the end in verse 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determined. It seems that Paul and the other apostles then never saw a charisma, a gift, simply as a natural talent or a natural ability, but something that was a supernatural talent or ability. The reason someone had that gift is because it was given to them by God, hence the term spiritual gift. A gift has a giver, and in this case, all those gifts come from God. I think it's worth pointing out that the word charisma is based on the word Charis, which is the Greek word for grace. These things are not natural born talents, but the gifts that God has graciously given us. Whether it be in teaching, uh, teaching adults, teaching children, in handling tech, computer, science things. Whether it's uh, the gift of praying or faith or in art and graphic design or music or administration or cooking or hospitality, encouragement, finance, whatever. All these gifts that we have come from the gracious hand of God. In fact, Paul says earlier on in the chapter, no one can even declare wholeheartedly that Jesus is Lord without God's Spirit in them. Even your ability to declare Jesus as the King of the world is a gift. It comes with God's help. And what Paul is doing here is he's levelling the playing field in terms of their spirituality. Seems, if we read between the lines, the Corinthians were grading themselves, ranking themselves uh, on their gifts. And whatever gift they had sort of put them on the ladder, on a scale. But Paul doesn't do that. He does rank the gifts but he doesn't rank people. Someone is no more important or no more spiritual just because they have the gift of prophecy over someone who has the gift of tongues. You are not more important or more spiritual if you have the gift as a leader compared to someone who has the gift of hospitality. No one is more or less important in terms of their gifts, what God has given them. Take a father who has two daughters. One is a super talented skier and goes on to join the national Olympic team and win a medal perhaps. The other has no sporting abilities whatsoever but goes on to be a a great and highly respected school teacher. Both exercise their gifts in various ways, one in sport, one in academia perhaps. Which daughter is the father most proud of? Which of the two does he love more or does he think more highly of? Well, if he's got his head on straight, there won't be any difference between them whatsoever. The father loves them both equally. They're no different in his eyes. And this should apply to us. We all have different gifts. Some are much more up front and public. Some are behind the scenes. But God views you in exactly the same light as anyone else. You don't need to feel inferior. Or those of us who get proud don't need to feel superior to other people. These gifts all come from 
one god, and that just levels the playing field. The Corinthians had no room for boasting then, and nor should we. But lastly, and I think we can lump much of our application under this final point, there's one goal. There are many gifts and there are many gods vying for our allegiance to use these gifts. But there's one giver and finally there's one goal. And this comes out chiefly in verse 7. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now what does he mean by the common good? What is this goal of working our gifts out for the common good. Well, if we step back for a moment and think, what is the big goal of all of life? What are we all here for? Well, it's to love God and love others. The common good is to bring about both those things, to bring about a relationship with God that so that we love him and to bring about good and great relationships with one another as we love one another. Um, and we're to do that in all areas of life. The gifts have been given to us for the common good of fulfilling that one goal of loving God and loving others. So in practical terms, if you're a gifted singer or a graphic designer or a great teacher or a highly skilled book editor, or a completely nerdy computer geek, then you are to use that gift for the common good, to bring others closer to one another, to bring them closer to God, to help people uh, find God, and to be an example to others. Now, of course, <laughs> we use these gifts to get a source of income, for a job or career or a hobby or whatever. But ultimately, the gifts that God has given you and me are for his kingdom, his purposes, uh, and that is to love him and love others. Each of us have to work out, am I using my best gifts that God's given me for myself is that my goal? Is it to earn money for my kids so they have a great inheritance one day? What, what, is, what is the ultimate goal you're, you're using your God-given gifts for? It should ultimately be for the common good. And that common good is living for God and living for others. If you start living for yourself, your own career, your own reputation, you start working ultimately for you, for money, then you're simply moving back into Corinthian idolatry. You start using the very thing that God gave you for the common good, just for your good. Do you see? Some of us within our churches are very good with finance. Uh, you're a banker, um, or you're a hedge fund manager, whatever that means. I have no idea what you people do. But it's clear that you're good with money, you understand finance and so on. How can you use those gifts, not just to earn a lot of money or climb the corporate ladder, but how can you use those gifts for the common good? Can you be an advisor to a Christian charity or a Christian school? Can you help out with your own church's finances? Some of us are very skilled are very gifted in the area of teaching. Can you use your teaching skills to teach young people in church or help a family that's struggling with school by offering to be a tutor during the week? That is helping out in the way Paul, I think, is telling us to use our gifts. The thing is, is that there are many gifts, multiple gifts, uh, more than I think are listed here in the Bible that can come under the term of serving or speaking or whatever. There are many gifts and all of us have at least one. 
how are you using your gifts? Because there are many gods in our society vying for your time, your money, your effort to use your gifts so that they benefit. But is it for the common good? We've got to remember that all these gifts come from God to be used for him and for his kingdom to bring us to one goal that is to love him and love 